NATO will begin to fragment and will not find consensus on what it thinks about its future relations with Russia. And if, if, if Trump is elected, that process will start the day after the election. Uh, just to pick up on something you were talking about before, the position that the Ukrainians are in, in that they don't know if and when and how many artillery rounds, ammunition is going to be provided by allies. And they're having to make calculations and decisions based on what may or may not arrive. There's a recent quote by a senior Ukrainian uh, military official in Politico complaining that they never get the Western systems at the right time and when they need them. And when they do arrive, they're irrelevant. He was actually talking about specifically about F-16s, which he said would no longer be relevant in, in the coming year. Do you think um, Ukraine's allies are ever going to equip it to win the war? It's a very good question. I mean, so far, the allies have been equipping Ukraine not to lose, um, but not specifically to win, because the allies are not really united about what winning means. I mean, I've got no problem in understanding what winning means. For me, it's, it's throwing the Russians out of everything that they've conquered since 2022. And that would look like winning. And then winning better than that would be throw them out of some of the st uh, territories they've conquered since 19, uh, 2014. But within the Allies themselves, they, there's not a lot of agreement about, upon that. And there's a lot of nervousness, particularly in Germany, about giving Ukraine enough weapons to really hurt the Russian forces. And so they, they end up dithering between giving the Ukrainians just about what they need to defend themselves, always a bit too late, and more Ukrainian lives are lost as a result of it but not providing the weapons to allow the Ukrainians really to throw the Russians out because too many Western politicians are frightened of Russia if they are thrown out. And in that sense, I mean, Putin has got the frighteners on a lot of Western politicians, um, not here in the United Kingdom, but certainly in the United States, in Germany, in Italy, in parts of Southern Europe. They, they don't want him to succeed, but they don't want him to fail because they're frightened of him. On the diplomatic front, Britain's Foreign Secretary David Cameron stopped off to see Donald Trump uh, on his visit to the UK, uh, US. He's bound to have talked about aid to Ukraine and NATO after Trump effectively invited Putin to do whatever he liked to members who didn't spend 2% of their GDP on defence. Is the panic setting in, do you think? Yeah, I wouldn't describe it as panic, but it's certainly a, a sober sort of realisation that uh, NATO will be in a different place next year. Um, whether Trump wins the election or not, even if, if Biden wins the election, nevertheless, the atmosphere in the United States is different uh, now than the way it was in 2022. And the Gaza crisis is distracting America in a pretty big way. And that's not going to go away anytime soon either. So I think there's a, there is a sense in NATO that we're into a new phase now and that um, helping Ukraine defend itself will be harder and more expensive than we thought it would be originally. Um, it will be a longer term commitment. And also that, that NATO, although NATO is in some respects stronger than it's ever been in its history before, as a result of this uh, invasion in all sorts of ways, nevertheless, it's also very brittle. And this NATO of 32 nations may start to dismantle itself under political pressure. Certainly if Trump wins the election, a number of countries in Southern Europe, in Hungary, in Slovakia, in Austria, um, other countries, not in uh, like Serbia, who is very pro-Putin, they will lean towards Russia on the assumption that NATO is about to be deconstructed. And NATO will fall into a sort of a tough-minded northern NATO and a very soft-minded, pro-Russian-minded or philosophical about Russia sort of minded southern NATO. And what, what do you mean, sorry, Mike, when you say that, that NATO might begin to be dismantled exactly? I think NATO might start to dismantle itself because before, I mean, if Trump is elected in November and takes over in January, between November and January, I would expect, you know, Hungary and Slovakia, Austria to start to do deals with Russia. And the Russians will be very aware of this. They'll start to make attractive offers on gas, uh, on uh, oil provision, on sort of certain sorts of aid. There'll be a big propaganda push. And a lot of people in Southern Europe will say, look, the reality is the Russians are going to get away with this. So we've got to adjust ourselves to that. It's no good saying that they must not succeed. The fact is they will succeed. And the new reality for us is that we have to live with a resurgent Putin. Now, we won't say that in Northern Europe. The Scandinavians certainly won't say it. The Baltics won't. We won't. Poland won't. But we'll be a smaller group of nations, 10 nations, say, in the north of, of, of Europe, with an uncertain America or an America about whom we are uncertain. And France and Germany, we don't quite know what view they will take of it. And so that politically, um, NATO will begin to fragment 
and will not find consensus on what it thinks about its future relations with Russia. And if, if, if Trump is elected, that process will start the day after the election. Very interesting and quite a, a scary thought. Um, in, in terms of, of David Cameron's visit to the US, um, it's, he's trying to get this, uh, this uh, aid deal that you mentioned, the $61 billion US package approved. President Zelensky has said without it, Ukraine will lose the war and he will be wanting to pay, paint that worst case scenario, won't he, to secure that package. Is, is he right? I think he's right that if he doesn't get that um, package, that Ukraine will lose this year of the war, which means they'll lose more territory. Um, and then it becomes a question of whether Zelensky stays in power. Um, what the Russians are hoping for, I think, is not that they could march to Kiev and take it over this year, but that they could put so much pressure all the way round on, uh, on, on Ukraine that there would be um, a political coup in effect in Kiev Zelensky be removed and he'd be replaced by somebody who will do a deal. I think that's what they're probably hoping for this year. If the American aid package comes through, that almost certainly won't happen. If it doesn't come through, there's a fair danger that it will happen. Um, and other aid, I mean, the, the EU aid um, that is being proposed, I mean, 50 billion euros, is coming through in stages. NATO's own plan, this um, uh, NATO mission on Ukraine, as Stoltenberg talks about it, is 100 billion over five years. And even if that's agreed at the NATO summit in, um, in Washington in the summer, um, that will come in in stages. Um, the problem is that, that all of this is drip feeding Ukraine and making life for Zelensky much harder. If Zelensky could, could get the hit of one big aid package, which will keep Ukraine going, then he keeps his job. If it looks as if for all of his grandstanding around the world, the world is still not prepared to support Ukraine enough, then his job is on the line. And that's really what it comes down to. He needs the political popularity of bringing the world to support Ukraine. And that's not just a financial issue, it's a morale issue. If the Ukrainians feel that the world is really supporting them, the outside Western world is really supporting them, they'll sign up to fight. But if they feel that the world is turning their back on Ukraine and that they are going to lose anyway this year and maybe next year, then why, why turn up to fight? Why not just accept the inevitable? And so in that respect, this aid package is really, really important. One other point um, is that there is increasing interest in having Japan step in also to provide aid because Japan, interestingly, as an Asian power, sees the Ukraine crisis in exactly the same way as NATO sees it and as the Biden administration in the United States sees it. So although Japan is a long way away and the other end of the, the, other end of the globe from the Ukraine crisis, it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that Ukraine could do everybody, uh, that Japan could do everybody a favor and step in with a, a significant financial package. How likely is that looking at the moment? It's a proposal, and um, Kishida, the uh, Ukrainian... Ugh, I keep saying Ukraine, I'll say that again. It's a proposal, and the Japanese Prime Minister, Mr Kishida, is in Washington. I don't think they're going to make any announcements about anything like that, but the, I think they may be talking about it and discussing it. And there's a lot of interest in building on this Japanese determination to help the West keep Russia contained because they know that a, an ascendant Russia will also bolster an ascendant China and then the Taiwan crisis gets worse, the whole East Asia crisis or East Asia tensions get worse. And so just as the Western world has, has as it were, at least drawn a line in the sand officially over Ukraine, Japan seems inclined to draw that same line in the sand for the same reasons. A line in the sand. Where do you think Western thinking is on Ukraine? Is it to give Ukraine just enough to stop short of victory but enforce a stalemate um, so that a settlement can be found? It's unthinkable uh, to many Ukrainians, but how avoidable is it? I think the West feels that if the Ukrainians eventually go to some sort of ceasefire or peace talks on favourable terms to them, then that will be good enough. But only the Ukrainians can decide when they're prepared to negotiate. They shouldn't have to negotiate under duress with 15% of their territory being, having been invaded by uh, a foreign power. And so um, there is that sort of sense that the, the line in the sand is to support whatever Ukraine's, whatever Ukraine's decision is about what Ukraine decides is effectively the line of victory. But that, of course, is a rather 
um, movable line. And that's one of the problems for the West is that we talk about these terms, we'll back Ukraine for as long as it takes, we'll do whatever it takes. We say that, but we don't know in our own minds um, what that really means. As I say, I've got a very clear view in my mind what that means, but that's not the same as, as the um, most state people in Europe or even in Kiev for that matter. Professor Michael Clark, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time. <laughs> You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. You could, oh, sorry. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. If you'd like to support us, you can subscribe now or listen to Times Radio or go to thetimes.co.uk. My thanks to our producer today, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. Bye for now.